Considering LASIK surgery? How much do you really know about it? On this episode of OcuTalk, we'll be speaking with Dr. Aparna Patel in detail about LASIK, as well as other corrective surgery alternatives. Dr. Patel? I want to talk to you. Not now, later. No, now. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for a brand new episode of OcuTalk. My name's Nick, and today we have a very special guest joining us from Bennett and Bloom Eye Centers, Dr. Aparna Patel. Dr. Patel, thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, thanks for having me. Absolutely. And uh, Dr. Patel, before we get started, I was hoping that maybe you can explain a little bit about your background and your specialty to our viewers. Sure. So um, my name is Aparna Patel. I actually was born in Canada. I grew up in Michigan. I attended the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor for my undergrad degree, and I studied uh, kinesiology and movement science and pre-med. And then I went directly into medical school at the University of Cincinnati. And following that, I moved back to Michigan, did my residency at William Beaumont Hospital in Royal Oak, and then went on to a cornea uh, external disease and refractive surgery fellowship at the Cleveland Clinic. After that, I actually joined Bennett and Bloom um, in Kentucky. And I joined a multi-specialty group where I am one of two corneal surgeons and one of four um, cataract surgeons. And and I am the only refractive surgeon in the practice. Uh, so I do cataracts, cornea, LASIK, PRK, um, all anterior segment types of surgeries, as well as different types of lasers in the office and in the OR. Awesome. Thank you for that information, Dr. Patel. And again, so happy to have you here. Uh, so for our discussion today, uh, we were hoping that you could uh, talk to us a little bit about LASIK. And so can you explain what exactly is LASIK surgery? Yeah, so it's a great question. So LASIK actually stands for Laser Assisted In Situ Keratomalusis. So in layman's terms, what that means is LASIK basically uses two lasers to reshape the surface of the cornea or the surface of the eye. So the first laser is a femtosecond laser, and that is used to create a flap of tissue on the cornea. The surgeon then lifts that flap, and then a second laser is used to treat the actual cornea underneath it with the patient's prescription. The surgeon then puts the flap back down, smooths it out, and that's it. That's LASIK. Well, awesome. Very informational. Thank you very much. And uh, so what's the difference between LASIK surgery and other vision correction surgeries like LASIK and PRK? Can you explain that to our viewers? Yeah, so that's a great question. So PRK stands for photorefractive keratectomy. And fun fact, I've actually had PRK in both of my eyes. Um, but PRK, the difference between LASIK and PRK, so LASIK, like I said, the, there's two lasers and one, the first laser creates the flap. Well, with PRK, there's no flap. So what uh, that procedure is, the surgeon removes the top layer of cells called the epithelium. And then that second laser that we use in LASIK is used to reshape the cornea. So there's no flap involved. After the cornea is reshaped with that laser, uh, the surgeon puts a contact lens over the eye and allows the patient to heal on their own. So their own epithelial or skin cells heal back on their own. The disadvantages of PRK is um, are that it is a little durable because that epithelium has to heal within that first week post-operatively. Um, however, the advantages are that people who may not be candidates for LASIK may be candidates for PRK because we are altering less tissue since we don't have to use a flap. Um, the other advantage of PRK is that, um, like I said, there's no flap. So we don't have to worry about flap complications, flap moving, lodging of the flap, et cetera, et cetera. So it is a nice alternative to LASIK and the visual outcome is just as good. It just takes a little bit longer to get there. Um, LASIK with an E, so that stands for laser assisted sub epithelial keratectomy. And basically what LASIK is, is it's pretty much similar to PRK. So we take the top layer of cells off the epithelium. We use that second laser to treat the surface of the cornea. And then the surgeon actually puts that epithelium back on. So it's essentially PRK 
with the epithelium going back on at the end. Now, a lot of surgeons don't do LASIK anymore just because the healing time is still prolonged, just like PRK. The patient still has to heal from it. The epithelium still has to smooth out. So there really aren't too many advantages over PRK, and it is a little bit more challenging to perform that procedure. However, there are some surgeons that still do this procedure and they still have great results. Awesome. Thank you for letting us know the differences between those, doctor. And uh, Dr. Patel, we've talked about candidates for LASIK. So what exactly makes a good candidate for LASIK surgery? So the number one good candidate is somebody who has realistic expectations. So LASIK is definitely changing, um, but it's not perfect. So it will definitely get you glasses and contacts, um, you know, independence. However, it's not, it may not get you perfect, perfect vision. There's a chance you're going to get really, really good vision, but people who come in who say they want, you know, laser focused vision, that's, you know, absolutely perfect. I like to kind of set their expectations a little bit lower and say, yeah, you're going to have really good vision, but it's, it may not be perfect. Doesn't mean you have had a bad result. Um, the other things we look at to determine if someone is a good candidate, well, first is their prescription. So we look at their prescription. We look at the stability of that prescription over the last several years. Um, we definitely don't want to operate on someone whose prescription is changing because it'd be like operating on a moving target. Um, we also take a picture of the cornea at the evaluation called a topographic map. And what that does is it screens for corneal diseases that would disqualify a patient from having LASIK or PRK. Um, and examples of that would be keratoconus, pellucid marginal degeneration, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the procedure, the way it's performed, we actually remove corneal tissue when we do it. So we look at the corneal thickness of the patient um, to ensure that there's enough tissue that we can safely remove. We also take into consideration age. So LASIK is FDA approved um, for patients above the age of 21, but can be performed in patients younger than that, given that they have a stable prescription. Um, LASIK can also be done in older patients. Now, that's a common misconception that you can't have LASIK once you're a certain age. That's not true. Everybody's a little bit different and everybody has different visual goals. So it just depends um, on the patient and them talking with their doctors and seeing what's the best um, uh, method of correcting their uh, refractive error, uh, talking with the doctor and figuring that out. Perfect. And uh, so, Dr. Patel, uh, we've talked about what makes uh, someone a good candidate for LASIK. On, on the opposite end, what would be the factors that would maybe disqualify somebody from not receiving LASIK? Good question. So too thin of a cornea is one, because like I said, we have to we have to remove tissue. Um, having too thin of a cornea combined with too high of a prescription, because the higher the prescription, the more tissue we need to alter. Um, fluctuating prescriptions, kind of like I mentioned earlier. Uh, corneal dystrophies, corneal ectatic diseases like keratoconus, um, unrealistic expectations. And then lastly, women uh, should not undergo refractive surgery if they are actively pregnant or breastfeeding. So that's something else. Um, there are some other ocular diseases that we, um, like autoimmune diseases, uveitis, herpetic diseases, things like that, that we look at very closely if we, are, if we were to consider refractive surgery in those patients. So those are something that we also look at. Well, awesome. Thank you again, Dr. Patel. We appreciate that. And, um, and you know, kind of not to get off topic here, but as someone who's received LASIK surgery before in the past, I know that it only takes about like maybe 20, 30 minutes, maybe. So I'll be, that being said, how many patients do you typically see in a day when we're doing LASIK surgery? That's a great question. So when I do LASIK, I would say I do anywhere. I typically do around 14 to 15 eyes per day. Um, now that also depends. Sometimes I do more, sometimes I do less. Um, but yeah, you're right. It takes about 15 to 20 minutes to do each case. Um, and so you add all that up and that's about how many I get done. Now, if we're talking about um, cataract surgeries, those are a little bit faster. So those I'll, see, I'll, you know, I'll do anywhere from 18 to 22 a day. But um, it, LASIK does take a little bit longer, and we are usually doing both eyes. So that adds a little bit of time as well. Perfect. Thank you so much, doctor. And uh, Dr. Patel, 
do you have uh, your pre-op and like post-op recommendations for your LASIK patients? And do you mind uh, letting our audience know exactly what those are? Yeah, that's a great question. So pre-operative protocols that I recommend are we like to keep patients out of their contacts for at least one to two weeks prior to their evaluation. Uh, certain types of contact lenses can warp the cornea and that can change the measurements and the testing that we obtain on that visit. Uh, the other thing I like to suggest, especially to my female patients, is remove all eye makeup for one week prior to surgery. So no my eye makeup whatsoever for one week prior and one week post-surgery. And that's just to prevent any debris um, from any uh, mascara, eyeliner, eyeshadow, any of that getting into the eye and getting into the tear film and causing irritation and problems down Um Post-operatively, I like to tell people, you know, no eye rubbing for one week after the procedure, no swimming pools or hot tubs or dirty water sources near the eye for that one week either, no dirty, dusty environments, and again, no eye makeup for the one week afterwards. Well, awesome. Thank you again, Dr. Patel. And I, I remember having the eye shields over my eyes and not being able to touch it for a while. So yeah, it, it's tough, but it's definitely worth it at the very end. <laughs> uh, but Dr. Patel, um, so can the procedure be, pre, uh, can it be repeated? Uh, did you recommend it that you need to be re repeated after you have the surgery? So it can be repeated. Now, um, if an enhancement is necessary, then yes, absolutely. I recommend that it be repeated. And the nice thing about LASIK is that an enhancement is fairly easy. The surgeon just has to go in, lift up that flap that was already created and use that second laser again to treat whatever prescription was left over after uh, their first surgery. Um, we restart the healing process. We restart the eye drops. We restart, you know, the, the post-operative protocols and everything like that. But yes, I do feel like if there is a little bit of a resistance then having an enhancement is definitely worth it um, and definitely uh, it pays off. Perfect. Awesome. And uh, Dr. Patel, what new technologies and new developments are out there for LASIK surgery that you would like to let us know about that are on the horizon? That's a really good question. So um, there is a procedure called SMILE, um, and that stands for Small Incision Lenticule Extraction. And that's a relatively newer procedure here in the United States. And what that is, is we use that first laser, the first laser I talked about with LASIK, to basically cut an incision in the cornea and uh, create a little lenticule underneath and inside the cornea. And then the surgeon goes in and dissects that lenticule out and takes it out. So it's it, again, removing tissue. Um, the advantages of SMILE is that here there's no flap. Um, but we're not taking that top layer of cells off. So it's a lot more comfortable for the patient in terms of the healing is faster than say PRK and is more comfortable than PRK. Um, LASIK can sometimes give patients some dry eye symptoms. And theoretically, because uh, SMILE does not create an actual flap, um, there's thought to be less incidence of dry eye. So this is a better option for people who already maybe suffer from mild dry eye who may not be the best LASIK candidate. So that's kind of what's out in the horizon. That's what's becoming a little bit more popular these days. Dr. Patel, is there anything that you'd like to tell our audience before we leave today? You know, one interesting comment that I get a lot is that uh, patients will come up to me and say that they were told they couldn't have LASIK because they have astigmatism. And that is completely not true. So I just want people to know that astigmatism is a wonderful indication for LASIK or PRK or any type of refractive surgery. So if you have nearsightedness, astigmatism, even mild forms of farsightedness, um, you could be a great candidate for one of these procedures. So you don't have to live with contacts and glasses for the rest of your life just because you may have been told a long time ago that you weren't a candidate. Things have changed and technology has improved. So I um, encourage everyone to go get, go get another opinion, especially if it's been a while, to see if um, the new technologies would help uh, help you see better. Awesome. Uh, Dr. Patel, we learned so much today from you. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. That was Dr. Aparna Patel from Bennett and Bloom Eye Centers. Dr. Patel, thank you so much for joining us again. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it.